Welcome, everybody. It's so great to welcome you to the 2023 Micro-Credential Forum, Pathways for Jobs is our theme. My name is Rich Lutet, and over the past year, I've had the pleasure of leading all things micro-credentials, while Emma Gooch, who I'm sure all of you know, has been on her maternity leave. As part of that work, I get the pleasure of hosting today. Over the past six years, the Micro-Credential Forum has evolved from theory to practice in the world of micro-credentials. We've debated definitions. We've spent time focusing on the learners. We've heard success stories from pilot program leaders, shared practical tools for those looking to develop their own micro-credentials, and now we're putting the spotlight on employers and the impacts within the labor market. At eCampus Ontario, our focus for micro-credential programming is about getting people into programs and then into jobs. That final step being a critically important element of micro-credentials. We're very excited at the road ahead with many great initiatives that will spotlight the linkages between micro-credentials and the labor market. At this time, I'd like to invite Robert Luke, uh, the CEO of eCampus Ontario, to come and say a few words to kick off today's event. Thanks everybody for coming. Hope you uh, had an enjoyable lunch. I did. It was delicious. Um, so thanks for your introduction and welcome everybody uh, to the in-person session of this year's Micro-Credential Forum. Uh, to begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land here in Toronto that we are meeting on. It's the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat peoples. It's now home to people from all over the world and certainly uh, many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, I'm a treaty land inhabitant and I'm just gonna point out today, I was told I couldn't wear this because it would interfere with the microphone, but I was gifted this today by Bill uh, Min Mintram, who's the director, it's a lanyard to hold your thing, uh, who's the director of the Rideau Hall Foundation's uh, Indigenous and Northern Affairs and I encourage you to look up what they're doing uh, because they're doing teacher education materials for, um, for Indigenous teacher education. Um, but we had a discussion about this, so I, I think it's relevant to mention. So I'm a treaty land inhabitant, and my parents immigrated to Saskatchewan from the United Kingdom in the 1960s. I, I was born in Saskatchewan, and I grew up loving the expansiveness of the prairie, but I was wholly ignorant of the colonial regime that actually allowed my parents to move to this country and live and work here. The ability of indigenous people to harvest from and thrive on the land where we live has been grievously impaired by colonization. Indigenous people's freedom to use and enjoy these lands was further eroded by treaties. These treaties exacerbated injustices for indigenous people, including poor compensation, inadequate reserve lands, and the inability to freely exercise harvesting rights. Acknowledging the wrongs of the past is an important step because it lets us take responsibility for the future. And this is part of my personal commitment to the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action. We are all, each and every one of us, treaty people. And uh, I was discussing this with Bill today, um, who reminded me also that most people don't actually know this. Uh, and I think it's important to what we're talking about in terms of continuing education like micro-credentials. And actually, it was only a few months ago on this very stage in this very room at our test conference, maybe three months ago, that one of our panelists asked us to, or reminded us, that we should take joy in, in uh, realizing our treaty obligations. And that really stuck with me. And I think it's a great way to frame, not just today, but uh, what we are doing uh, as a society here in Canada and also as citizens of the world. So as Rich said, the theme for today is Pathways for Jobs. To frame our discussion, I'm going to ram off a few facts that I think everybody should know. There's no test. Canada has the second highest level of attainment of tertiary education in the OECD. We're number one in the G7. Two thirds of our population today have a tertiary credential. 66.4% if you're really exact. So 0.2% shy of two thirds, but still. 
The majority of students entering today into tertiary education are mature learners. We have a system that was designed for direct entry from high school, but they are the minority of learners entering education today. It's a small minority, but it's growing. These learners will continue to access education throughout their lifetime. We think that one of the ways they're going to do that is through micro-credentials. Indigenous and immigrant learners are the two growing demographics, or actually the only two growing demographics in Canada that will be seeking tertiary education. And micro-credentials offer really good avenues of access for Indigenous learners, who, those learners who have historically been marginalized and, and prevented from succeeding in primary and secondary education, notwithstanding post-secondary. And for new, many newcomers to Canada already have a credential and they're looking for ways to uh, have fast routes into labor market participation. So fundamentally, micro-credentials support agile participation in the innovation economy and our collective ab ability to address key challenges that the world faces today. Number one is reconciliation, in no particular order, I guess, climate change, the integration of new technology and everything we do, and the intangibles economy. They're all important shifts that we are collectively responding to. So 600 years ago, not today, uh, the invention of the printing press increased access to knowledge. I think it's fitting that we're in the Globe and Mail building. Do they even have a printing press anymore? I mean, they must. Does anybody read a paper, paper anymore? A few of them, okay. You do, okay. Yeah. I switched a while ago to the digital version. I can never go back. But I need the version that looks like the actual paper it's like a school morph. I love it. Anyway, the widespread dissemination of books led to increased literacy and a new openness of education. Now, this disruption changed how people learned and how people work. 300 years ago, the invention of the steam engine ushered in the first industrial revolution. And this disruption changed the tempo for how we learn and how we work. It's also the direct antecedent of the situation we find ourselves in today where we're all looking for ways to address and mitigate the effects of climate change. 40 years ago, as of January 1st, 1983, by the way, I looked it up, the invention of the internet led to even more rapid diffusion of knowledge and has certainly changed almost all aspects of learning and work. So happy 40th birthday, internet. The point here is that each successive wave of technology brings with it the need for new skills and new competencies. The real difference today is the acceleration that we see this happening. We see and we talk a lot about the advent of the fourth industrial revolution, the imposition or interpolation of advanced electronics, robotics, other technologies like artificial intelligence. All of these are changing ways in which we live and work. The degree of reskilling that will constantly be demanded of new industries as these new industries emerge and existing ones retool is really significant and perhaps most significant is the need to address the challenges and opportunities of transitioning to a low carbon economy. A prime example of how these challenges have come together and how they're being addressed with innovation and urgency is in the automotive sector. It's actually one of Ontario's largest industries. It employs about 125,000 people, uh, directly employs 125,000 people. It accounts for more than one-fifth of the province's exports and contributes $14 billion into our GDP annually. The sector also has a long and fruitful partnership with Ontario's post-secondary educational institutions. 12 of our universities and all 24 of our colleges have automotive-focused programs. The development of low and no carbon vehicles is a big shift for this industry, and it's a very important one as well. That's why I'm looking forward to tomorrow's keynote by Dr. Raad Kadri. He's the head of the Ontario Vehicle Innovation Network. As we will see from his keynote, micro-credentials play a critical role in preparing learners with the skills for the future of work and the economic transition that comes with reducing our impact on the environment. Examples like this show how Ontario's post-secondary institutions are uniquely positioned to help learners find programs and pathways to employment. And we also have some great speakers today that are going to talk. I see Sanjeev Gill over there is going to talk about what they're doing at Watt Speed. I chatted briefly with Trisha, who I don't see right now. But, oh, it's right over there. Is going to be joining you momentarily from the Future Skills Centre. Uh, but the automotive industry isn't the only sector that benefits from this type of on-demand upskilling and retraining. Healthcare is an area that we're seeing uh, rapid, maybe not rapid enough, changes in scopes of practice, and micro-credentials can help train people to take on new aspects 
develop new capabilities to take on new aspects of what they can practice for. It's also a path for internationally trained, um, foreign trained healthcare workers uh, who are seeking to gain entry into practice here. Manufacturing, we've already talked about the acceleration of robotics and artif artificial intelligence. All of these are examples where retraining and reskilling are really, really essential. I don't think we could find uh, uh, any area of society or, or the economy that is not impacted uh, by an accelerating rate of change. I think it's worth noting, in the innovation economy, we're all learning a living, and that's where micro-credentials come in. And I'll just conclude with a little bit of a discussion about our focus on learners, because it's important, and it's also intentional. We are proud to support uh, the province of Ontario's micro-credential strategy. We support the micro-credential portal, which uh, lists OSAP eligible micro-credentials. By the way, one of the most significant policy changes that I've witnessed in post-secondary education in more than one decade of participation. The micro-credential portal is a learner-focused platform that pro promotes career wayfinding. It helps learners find the programs they need for the career preparation they want. As Rich said, it helps put people into programs and ultimately into jobs. Uh, we're pleased to be working with the Ministry of Colleges and Universities on supporting best-in-class access to micro-learning. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge we have some folks from MCU here today. I'm pretty confident there's one. Is Anna not here? Tamara? Oh, there she is. Hi, Anna. Welcome. <laughs> That's quite all right. It's always an inopportune moment to find somebody. I edited my remarks so she thought she had more time, you see. <laughs> uh, so our role at eCampus Ontario is about bringing together all the stakeholders involved so that we can better understand each other's capabilities and contributions, so people like you. So thank you very much for coming and joining the conversation. It's very gratifying that we can uh, attend an event like this in person in a lovely place as well. Later, there may not be a uh, screen, so you can even look out uh, and feel the expansiveness of thought uh, that being high up in the sky um, can help. I think it's really important, though, because uh, this is our kickoff, obviously, for the next two day, this day of half, uh, half a day and then two half days of sessions. Uh, it's very important for us to share our stories and our experiences and our ideas, most importantly, to find ways to collaborate on a common vision for the future. Uh, I had a, a great uh, opportunity to chat with a few people over at lunch. Uh, Allison, who, uh, hi Allison, she was uh, formerly on our board, award-winning professor at the University of Ottawa and actually was on my hiring committee. Um, also, uh, Laurie Harrison, who uh, is also on our board, and I also had the chance to uh, um, chat with Mary Catherine from a PCAB, who's working on uh, quality assurance frameworks for um, micro-credentials, all very important. So I'm going to encourage you all to uh, listen attentively to all of the presentations that follow because there's some good ones today and then over the next couple of days. But more importantly, take some time to find out who's sitting next to you and learn a little bit about what their experience is and share your own because that's what we're here to do is to learn. So thank you very much for joining us today. And Rich, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Robert. So as Robert uh, mentioned, we uh, designed a hybrid program for the, the forum this year. Today represents the first of three days of programming. Tomorrow and Friday, we have two additional one-half days of online programming through our virtual conferencing system. Uh, registration is still open. I encourage you, if you are not signed up for the next two days, uh, please go ahead and register. And if you have a colleague that you think should join that part of the program too, please tell them that uh, registration is still open. We'd love to have them. Uh, so we're very excited about the program. Uh, this year we worked really hard to put together a lot of great stories c connecting micro-credential programming to the labor market. And we are about to embark on three days of insights on uh, future skills gaps that will be driven by technological change, the skill needs of small businesses, industry, academic, government partnerships, reskilling, upskilling, and programs that have been designed and driven purely based on employer demand, and new insights on uh, learner preferences. So with all that, let's get to the programming. Oh wait, I forgot my housekeeping. Um, 
There is a networking session at uh, four o'clock today. We hope you'll stick around for that. Um, you have already received your link to the survey, so please do uh, fill that in at some point before you leave today. And then finally, I just want to point you in the direction of this box in front of you. Uh, don't forget to take it with you. It would be such a shame. These are great little uh, pens that we've we've procured for uh, your takeaway, and uh, it would love we'd, we'd love them to take you with you. Take them with you. So please put it in your bag before you forget. All right, let's get to it. Um, first up, we have uh, micro credentials and the workforce of tomorrow, and I'd like to invite Dr. Trisha Williams to join me on the stage. Uh, Trisha is the Director of Research Evaluation and Knowledge Mobilization at the Future Skills Center. Uh, she brings a strong background across anthropology, sociology, and economics disciplines to her role, and has a particular expertise in the future of work, including digital economics, skill development, employ employment and labor markets, migration, and gender. So welcome, Trisha. Thank you very much for joining us. A lot of years of grad school. <laughs> I was gonna say, there's nothing kind of more painful than not only having your bio read, but have to stand next to the person while they're reading it. You know, that's like, I think I deserve a micro-credential for that. <laughs> but thanks so much, Rich, and thanks so much for, uh, to Lou, uh, Robert, Luke, and eCampus Ontario for, for the invitation. I'm really, I'm really thrilled to be here, particularly in person. I think, you know, we're getting back to in-person meetings, but I'm also getting back to in-person presenting, so. Bear, bear with me as, as we do that. I think uh, you're gonna put up my slides, right? Somebody is? I'm looking. Somebody's gonna, I hope. I worked hard on them. Uh, thanks, that's great. Um, do I do the clicker here? Yes? Yes, thumbs up. Okay, thanks, I can advance them myself, that's awesome. So as, um, as Rich said, I'm with the Future Skills Center. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about who we are at the Future Skills Center and talk a little bit about what we're learning about micro-credentials, about relationships with employers. And I loved all the setup that you were doing, Robert, about the connection with jobs and really setting this up as a conversation about how, how what are our objectives with micro-credentials and how can we facilitate more of that. Um, and so I have some thoughts on that, but they're emerging thoughts. So I'm, I'm really curious to hear more about the experiences in this room and how we can you know, advance this conversation together. So first, a little bit about the Future Skills Center. So we were launched in February 2019. We just had our fourth uh, birthday, fourth anniversary. So we're a very, very young organization. We're housed out of Toronto Metropolitan University, funded by the federal government's Future Skills Program. And we are part of a consortium with the Conference Board of Canada, with a research and design firm called Blueprint and also uh, working closely with a couple of the units at Toronto Metropolitan University, including the Diversity Institute and Magnet. So we have a, a clear mandate to focus on strengthening the skills development ecosystem in Canada with a very innovation-focused lens, innovation around skills development, and with a very strong mandate to be ensuring that all Canadians, especially those facing the most barriers or the most disadvantaged, have an opportunity to thrive in the future of work. So we know that the world is changing and, and this was really set up as an initiative to help you know, catalyze change in how we're thinking about skills development and trying and experimenting with some new approaches to skills development. And uh, our timing couldn't have been better, frankly. Between the pandemic and all the kind of changes coming after this, we were, we were put in place just at a moment, I think, where the conversation has really shifted. So we are now four years into a five-year mandate and you know, crossing our fingers and knocking on wood and having the conversations about uh, a renewed mandate for FSC. So we've been also very busy the first few years. Uh, so those of you who, who may have come across some of our work, um, we are focusing a lot of our efforts on what we're calling our three pillars of insights, solutions, and systems change. So we have now over 240 different research and innovation pilots from coast to coast to coast, all across the country, working closely with partners. And a lot of those projects have a lot of partners involved, not just one partner. 
Um, we focused our strategy on investing in labor market and skills information. So making sure that there's more readily available LMI for decision makers and eventually individuals. Also thinking about career pathways and how those career pathways can be more nimble and agile and moving away from what Robert discussed, you know, that kind of you enter the labor market and that's it, you're in one place for the rest of your life. And also thinking about employer and sector-based solutions, so connecting supply and demand and thinking about how employers are involved in addressing labor market challenges around skills. And then critically moving beyond pilots to thinking about scale, about replication, about um, you know, larger, larger footprints. And we have done quite a few projects that are testing what it means to move to scale. Those of you who know anything about innovation in Canada know that we have a pilot problem in Canada and a lot of projects get stuck at a pilot stage. So we're exploring that. Um, we're really proud of the fact that 75% of our projects are directly targeting and benefiting disadvantaged groups, underrepresented groups. Um, we keep that strong equity focus in everything that we're doing. And we've um, been starting to track some of the, some of the metrics in, in terms of the number of people who participate in our programs, but also critically how our knowledge is shifting dialogues and starting to think about systems change at a larger level. So that's kind of the, the start of, of FSC. Oh, here's a little bit of a, a geographic footprint in terms of the different provinces and territories that we have projects in. And you'll note that um, there's a couple little green circles there, and that's where we have agreements with provincial governments. So we started this off with uh, a, an agreement with the government of Quebec, the Commission de Partenariat du Marché du Travail, that oversees labor market um, partnerships in the province of Quebec. And uh, we also are working closely with the governments of British Columbia, Alberta, and Saskatchewan on some joint initiatives, and also uh, close to finalizing some agreements with some of the other provinces and territories. And of course, as a federally funded initiative in a very complex federation, we're quite proud of that. And we wanna continue to build on those partnerships. So, um, the problem we're solving, micro-credentials. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about um, some of the things I think that Robert already nicely introduced. Um, we know that there's been a lot of buzz, there's been a lot of talk about micro-credentials, about how they can solve these perplexing labor market challenges. And uh, those of you who were around when, you know, I would say five to seven years ago when there was, you know, a commission, the, Dom the Barton Report came out of Ottawa and there was talk about how Canada needs to become a learning nation. We need to think about learning and investment in skills development and training as more of a lifelong enterprise and not just at, at the start of your career. Um, so there's very much a momentum towards these shorter, more flexible training options. But there's also the theory that it's gonna better align with employer needs, right? So there's been a very much a part of that theory around micro-credentials was that this is gonna help solve some of those problems that the employers are wagging their finger and saying, post-secondaries, you're not doing what we need. We, you know, you're not meeting our needs and it's a kind of a common critique. Um, there's also been recognition, and I think eCampus Ontario has been phenomenal in this area of calling out the need for stackability or recognition or at, making sure that micro-credentials add up to something. Um, and also uh, making sense of where do we stand with prior learning recognition, especially with the critical issue right now of, of immigrants and newcomers coming into Canada and having their, their foreign degrees or their, their outside, outside Canada experiences not formally recognized in the system. And of course, all the inequity that that, that perpetuates. So we've, we've been thinking a lot about these issues and to be honest, when FSC was first created, we put out a few open calls and, and said to people, bring us, your, bring us your best, most innovative ideas. And there were quite a few in there that you could call micro-credentials. And really when we stepped back and started to take a look at some of those projects and you know, projects we funded, these are, these are good projects, I'm not dissing the projects. Um, but really, I think what we saw was that the innovation, per se, was mostly around the design and delivery of micro-credentials. So how can we design this course, or how can we take this curriculum and package it and call it a micro-credential? 
Um, there was usually some some employer consultations involved or employer. It, it wasn't that you know peop, people were saying we're not thinking about employers at all, but really that was the extent of the innovation that was proposed for the for the most part. And I'm talking in broad strokes and I'm not naming names intentionally. Um, so, uh, you know, I think a lot of times too, there was an assumption that, you know, yes, we'll test it, but we're going to find that this is the right thing. You know, there's no way we could say that this isn't working. You know, we're, so in a way, you know, kind of breaking our own researcher rules of, you know, those, any research nerds out there, like the null hypothesis was not being tested, right? So, um, so I think we, we started to ask some questions amongst ourselves and saying, you know, this is good. This is fine. This is great that institutions are asking, how can we be more responsive? How, but how, how can we go a little bit further? And how can we, you know, really push our testing a little bit more? And so, you know, we started to ask a lot of questions about what's next. So how will employers recognize and reward micro-credentials? Is, like, are, is there, are they actually getting the skills they want in their, la in their labor force? Is it solving a need for them? Or is it just kind of more of the same? And it's packaged the same way. It's packaged differently, but it's not really solving a need. And then the second question is individuals who are taking micro-credentials. Are, how are they benefiting? So are they, and I mean, those two questions are linked, obviously, right? But are they getting a raise? Are they getting a new opportunity? Are they able to change jobs? You know, what do those outcomes look like for those individuals beyond just completing and getting a certificate, right? So this is kind of where, where, our, where our mind was going. Um, I will say related to that, and it isn't in the slides because it is kind of hot off the press. We released, um, uh, a paper today, actually, a research report today in, in partnership with the Labor Market Information Council um, talking about employer-sponsored skills training. So the amount of money that employers are investing in skills training. And I think there was also kind of an assumption with the start of the conversation around micro-credentials that, you know, employers would be able to pony up and pay for some of this, right? And that they would, they would be at the table and they'd, they'd actually put dollars in. Um, and actually when we, uh, for, so the first, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give away the, the, one of the first conclusions of the paper that we released today, which is that um, there's really crappy data about this. We don't have a lot of data in Canada about how much employers are spending on skills training. What we do know is that we're not doing well. So 54% of employers are reporting that they're, they're spending money on skills training. Um, compared to OECD, we are slightly above average, but of course the OECD includes a lot of countries. We're below Finland, we're below the Netherlands, we're even below the US. So we're investing less per employee in terms of private expenditures on skills training. So there's really an expectation in Canada, I would say writ large, that the government should pay, right? So that seems to be unquestioned, or individuals, that it isn't necessarily employers who are investing. Um, so then, of course, the question becomes why, <laughs> right? Um, so there's a few things we're starting to learn. Um, one is that we won't really answer those questions without really a lot better tracking and outcome measurement, both of individuals and employers. So, you know, that, and that's hard work. You know, frankly, it's hard work. It's hard work even for universities, you know, to figure out what's happening to people. Um, but we've got some, some initiatives underway that are going to do that. And we also know that, um, Pressing workforce development challenges are not going to be solved by colleges and universities alone. And to be honest, they're not going to be solved by, you know, a few consultations with employers. It's going to involve much more in-depth, detailed partnership models that are harder, more complex, that are going to demand new skills of our employees to negotiate and build those partnerships, and that will really require shared buy-in. Um, we're going to need to influence policy development. If, if micro-credentials are going to respond to this promise, to this, this tantalizing potential, we're going to need more institutionalization, more systemization, and again, I'll call out the work of eCampus Ontario in helping drive that conversation and help drive that, um, that, that thinking around policy frameworks and bringing institutions together alongside governments. Um, and we're, we are seeing, you know, that there's an emerging, you know, critical path that, that, that could happen. And I'm going to talk about a couple examples of projects we have where we're starting to see of how this could look like, what it could look like in action. 
So the first one that we're, we're quite excited about, um, and actually I was in Ottawa last week meeting with the, the folks at EMC. So this is the Excellence in Manufacturing Consortium. If you don't know who they are, they're a network, I think, of about six to 8,000 employers across Canada of mostly small and medium enterprises. So most of their business members are quite small. I actually, I was like, why would anyone join you? Why would they pay the member fee? It turns out they buy electricity in bulk. So as soon as you join, you get a discount on electricity. So it's a huge incentive to join. And they do, you know, member surveys. So actually they, they just sent me some information this morning they have about their members investments and skills training. So, so um, quite exciting. But what we did was we, we started working with EMC and they got other sector councils involved in HR to the table, including BioTalent, the Agricultural Human Resources Council, um, the Technology Council, Tourism, not even listed on there is Aviation and Aerospace. We have a lot of the big sectors represented and what they've been doing is they've been saying, what are the skill needs that we see across our sectors, across that our members are asking for? What are the competencies that we need? And that are actually, what's the base level across our sectors that we say, you know, somebody could move between the sectors because they, they can demonstrate they know problem solving or they know these, these kind of digital fluency or these things. And it's been led by the employers. So we're saying, what would happen if the employers were in the driver's seat around micro-credentials? How is that gonna change the equation? I mean, we don't have the answers yet, frankly, <laughs> um, but we're getting there. And we are seeing that um, they, they want to do it. The employers are interested. They have enthusiasm. They have energy. And they're cooperating with each other. We're right now in the part where they have to say, OK, we need to engage with post-secondaries to say, can you help us develop and, and deliver these micro-credentials? Gosh, they are having a hard time. The question to us two weeks ago was, which institution do you know? Because you know we just keep getting roadblocks, 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 roadblocks. People don't want to work with us, right? They they don't they say oh we've got our own thing or we've got this college and this college does this and it's fractured and you know they're navigating a complex system. I have some I have some empathy on both sides, right? We know these are hard things to say to do, but I I I do want to put it out there that we have employer groups that are trying to solve these same problems and they want partnership. Okay, but they are in the driver's seat, right? Um, so we're learning that, you know, uh, one of the things that employers have is they have a pretty low level of awareness of what's already done and they don't want to deal with like 10 institutions developing things. They don't know how to assess that. Um, and it is, it is really challenging for them to engage with the post-secondaries when, when they're kind of driving. Now, it's still in the work, so you can talk to me afterwards if you're like, yes, we'll sign up. So, and they have some leads. I'm not saying there's no leads, but that's been a little bit more, more tricky than maybe they had envisioned at the outset. Um, one of the things I'll say also just, and this is also not on the slides because it hit my inbox yesterday. So we're, we're doing a project with Nate in Alberta, Northern Alberta Institute for Technology. And they're do, they just completed a survey of how employers are, are responding to micro-credentials and looking at a few sectors specifically around you know, heavy machinery, um, oil and gas professions, advanced manufacturing. And it's actually really striking that employers are like, nope, not doing it for us. These people don't know the same thing. You know, and that we got all the, all the four technical colleges in Alberta involved, so it's not just a Nate thing. You know, there's, there's strong buy-in across the colleges and universities. And they say, you know, they're not, they're seeing micro-credentials more as a top-up to a base level of certification. And it's actually really shifting how Nate and, you know, uh, some of the Alberta discussions about micro-credential targeting and who it can target for. What I love about it, and we're still sifting out the, the actual findings and the implications, but what I love about it is the conversation is going to, what is the labor market problem we're solving, right? And rather than seeing employers as an impediment or like, oh, if only they do this, or if only they do that, if only they'd show up, right? We're starting to say, well, what do you need? What do you need and how can we work together across the market to help solve that challenge? Um, another one is we're working with a group called Anaconda Mining um, and we're thankful here that I'm really excited this project's just about to close. I'm really dying to get the final report. Um, 
never thought somebody would be so eager to see work close, right? Except, the, except for the research and evaluation person. Um, but really, that's, uh, it's been about rapid blended learning for minors on the go. Again, employers more in the driver's seat on this, on this one. And thinking about um, overall kind of employee empowerment, thinking about sectors in transition, and really seeing that, um, you know, this is part of a larger initiative for change management with this group of workers and thinking about them as not just, you know, participating and sucking up the micro credentials, but also being part of a vested group and stakeholder for the employer. Um, this one has a, a lot of uh, connections with the indigenous groups in the area and thinking about how to deliver micro-credentials in, in different ways to meet the needs of different learners, including with indigenous languages. So, um, in summary, you can tell we're doing a lot of thinking about this. We're excited to be working. We actually are very you know, excited to have things in the works with eCampus Ontario, including direct partnerships. Um, but we know that, you know, micro-credentials are not going to be a silver bullet. And I, I dare say that I wouldn't put my money on, you know, investing in more design and delivery of micro-credentials or only doing so in, in more creative ways that involve employers more from, from the outset and less as kind of at the end of the production timeline. You know, it isn't just that they're, they're stepping in at the end to hire people and validate it, but more closely involved. And that's, that's going to take a lot of unique partnership building. Um, and it's going to involve a lot more thinking about value and how do we create value, not just for the institution delivering the micro-credentials, but for the individuals taking them, for the employers who, who are looking for, who are hungry for skills. They are hungry for skills. The need is not going away. Um, and then, of course, as we know that we're going to need policy advances, we're going to need innovation around the business models. Who pays for all of these things? I don't think we can rest on the assumption that individuals and the government are going to be the only ones to pay. But of course, employers will only pay if they see value, if they see that it's, it's going to be um, people are coming out with the real skills that they want. And, you know, we really continue to see that, you know, creative partnerships are going to be at the core of innovation. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe end with a, a story about a project we're, we're really excited about before I'll take some time for questions. I love this countdown clock, but it's a little scary too, you know. Um, you almost, it, like, it's like the only times you see a countdown clock are on shows like 24 where it's, you know, a bomb's going to go off. So, um, but we're really excited about an initiative we have in Calgary that's working with Calgary Economic Development to transition people in the oil and gas sector into new careers in tech. Right, so perfect example of um, the need for rapid upskilling, retraining. People are mid-career. They don't have time to go back to school for a couple years. They've got families to feed, mortgages to pay. And uh, quite successfully, Calgary Economic Development has worked with you know, a bunch of the local colleges and university, Royal Roads, University, um, SAIT, Bow Valley College, um, a whole bunch of them to deliver uh, programs around, you know, data engineering, um, data an analysis, full stack engineers, and successfully putting people through a six to eight month program. Now that might not be so micro, micro slash macro credential, you know, and actually landing them in jobs in tech in Calgary. So you're really seeing like that's a, like we're so excited about this and thinking about what's working in that model. And I'll tell you at the core of it is partnerships is people at the table figuring it out, including the employers saying, we want to invest in Calgary, but we can't come here until we know that there's talent. And if you followed the news at all, despite the current downtown and downturn in hiring, you know, Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud have announced huge investments in Calgary, and Calgary's really doubling down on this as a potential, you know, uh, replacement for some of the, some of the white collar jobs in, that are declining in the oil and gas sector. So um, we are optimistic, but also questioning, I guess. So uh, I left seven minutes for questions. <laughs> Thank you. So I've been told I have to moderate my own questions, which means you know, anyone. Yes, please. Please and please introduce yourself too, oh. so I know who you are. Yeah. Um, my name is Oh yes, there's a mic. Oh. 
Thank you. My name's Christina Halliday, and I'm, um, I'm currently at OCAD University, but I also just recently spent some time in the professional association world. And um, as you talk about partnerships between employers and um, post-secondary, and, and you talk about scale and some of the difficulties, I just, having been in that pro professional association world, know that those groups are really interested in um, education for that's, you know, rapid, um, online, there's, you know, that's um, discrete, um, and they're not talking micro-credentials necessarily, but there's an interest in um, providing programming, learning programming for those professionals um, who need to continue to develop in their, in their worlds. And specifically, I was in the mental health sector, so they're, you know, they're thinking about, um, um, there's a challenge there to respond to, you know, you know what what's rapidly evolving in terms of mental health in Canada and and healthcare in general. So I'm just wondering. I, I'm sorry. I don't know from the um, future skill center side whether there's been any projects that investigated the relationship between um, professional associations, e like even national ones, right? And and uh, post secondary for as a kind of a framework or a site to offer um, for partnerships uh, between post secondary and the, you know, employers. I mean, I'm trying, in a way, I'm sure there are. <laughs> like, I'm trying to, I, it's only because I just read the, the summary. We, we did um, a project with, uh, I think that it was the Professional Engineers Association about remote work. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't so much around, um, like upskilling or professional development as kind of remote work practices, which is obviously a slightly different question. Um, but I think in general, you know, we've noticed a lot more of professional associations that are at the table, right? And I think even, you know, a part of our, our portfolio and work is thinking about how do we better harness the skills and capabilities of newcomers to Canada, right? And I think in those conversations 10 years ago, professional associations weren't there, right? They weren't there, they weren't, they weren't really vested in that, that problem. And now I think you see you know, the Ontario Nurses Association, the medical associations, they recognize the need to grow the, the labor force and to have better mechanisms for skill recognition and credentialing. Um, so I think, I think there probably are, so stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. There's yeah, a question. Thank you. Hi, Tricia. Uh, Pat Mayer from Nipissing University. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I'm just wondering how you see the rollout of micro-credentials or the work that you do in Future Skills, in the Future Skills Center as being equitable. Because what I'm seeing here is like the big money sectors, oil and gas, pharmaceuticals, engineering, um, the big urban centers, Calgary, wherever, wherever. How does this reach rural Canada and how does it reach like humanities or you know creative sectors or social sciences? So it's not just we're privileging those who can pay or where you said it's not a silver bullet, but it seems like a bunch of silver bullets in certain areas and the rest get left behind. Mm -hmm. What a great question. Um, so we have done some work with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce and thinking specifically about small and medium enterprises and a lot of those are rural. Um, we also, we have a program, uh, it, it's just less, uh, it's less further along because we started this a little later in our mandate, but we have a whole Northern skills strategy and working very closely with some indigenous governments and indigenous organizations around including some of these micro-credential issues in the North, which obviously is very rural, very remote, and is, is a lot harder to implement programs in. Right, because of um, you know it, systemic inequality, the barriers to accessing the North, all those sort of things. So I think probably the the things we have at our fingertips are a little bit more um, from some of the sectors. You, you're right that I mentioned in the talk. I think you know I think that's a it's going to be a huge challenge going forward. Right, making sure that frankly I'm not too worried about like the RBC banks of the world and their micro credentials. 
right? Like the big companies are gonna figure this out. They are investing the resources. It's the smaller institution, the smaller, you know, mom and pop shops, the smaller businesses that don't have a human resources development that are really weighing, you know, it's a big deal if they're gonna, you know, spend a thousand dollars for their employee to get a micro credential, right? They've got a really, that's why I think we're talking about ROI. That actually won't matter as much for the big companies. It's more the, the, the smaller ones. So I take your point, it's a great, great point, And I think something that we absolutely have to have front of mind going forward. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, and I am really looking forward to the next few days. Thanks. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Tricia, for kicking things off. I think um, curriculum innovation is cool, and let's make partnership innovation cool, too, is a key message I took from that. Um, <clears throat> So folks, this is our uh, first of two breaks this afternoon. Um, so we're going to break for 10 minutes um, and then our second break will be a little bit longer at, at 15. So we will be back at 1.55. Um, please help yourself to um, uh, coffee and tea during this break if you'd like. And uh, as a reminder as well, the bathrooms are straight back to the registration desk and then to the left. So we'll see you in 10. <laughs>